message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. Well, we're glad you were with us today, and we trust that our time together in God's Word will prove a blessing and help to you, especially at this uh, very special time of year. Uh, when, when you get down to the end of the year at uh, Christmas time, uh, the, the songs that you hear, the Christmas carols, you know, have you ever noticed there's just a spirit about it? And I know when I was um, in college, uh, I, was, I graduated from high school in the 60s and went to college in the 60s, the uh, generation of riot, rhythm, and revolution, you know. And uh, I was always fascinated during the Vietnam War uh, that there was always a Christmas ceasefire. Well, if you know anything about Vietnam and, and the communists, they weren't Christians. Uh, they had no reason to have any concern about the birth of Christ. Then I began to notice that all over the world at that period of time, there, there's a, a religi there are religious holidays. And I began to try to think, well, what, what is all that about? Why is that? And it didn't take long to, to, to learn. I mean, all it took was a trip to the World Book Encyclopedia and then to the Encyclopedia Britannica to find out that December 25th really didn't have anything to do with the date of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, in fact, associated with, a, with uh, the, the birth of the, the sun god, Ra. And uh, the, the fact that on the 22nd of December is the shortest day of the year. The sun goes down, it goes down, it goes down, and then it begins to, to come back. Uh, in its in, in the uh, the orbit patterns of the Earth around the Sun, and and our days began to get longer. And the heathen for centuries had used that date as a time to celebrate the the rebirth uh, of of the Sun, and actually the the uh, Sun S O N of the S U N God. And so so you began to find out that, and and of course the way that date got into the Christian Church was uh, back in the in the first uh, three four five centuries of of Christianity. The, uh, the, the church, rather than, than uh, going out and preaching the gospel, the organized uh, political movement that became uh, the church, went in and, and amalgamated with Constantine and so forth, amalgamated the, uh, the Roman Empire and all the heathen in it and all the heathen religion in it into the church. And because the heathen had the, the birthday for their, their god at that time, uh, there, was, there began to be celebrated a mass to honor and celebrate the birthday of, of Christ to kind of give them something to do on that time period. And uh, so you get Christ Mass, Christmas. And uh, there's, there's a lot of folks, you know, they, they say, well, you can't really know when Christ was born. And uh, beside the fact that it's not much of a birthday celebration for the Lord Jesus Christ, if there's anybody at Christmas time that's ignored, uh, it's Him. Uh, when was the last time you gave any presents to Jesus on Christmas? <laughs> Now, you know it wasn't very often, hadn't been very often, has it? You know, every now and then you get a little guilty, you know, and you, you take a, something to somebody in need and so forth and try to do something in, in the Lord's name, that kind of stuff. But that really, that really is not what we're talking about, you know. After we've, we've, we've read a verse of scripture and had a word of prayer, we all go out and consume our, consume it on our own lust. Uh, and yet there's a real spirit at Christmas. Uh, I live in the Chicagoland area and I've been, uh, down in, in, into the heart of the city. At Christmas time, uh, one time I was on the the, uh, the public transit, the L train, riding into the city, and and the day before Christmas, people were actually polite to one another, and someone commented, "Boy, it'd be nice if it was Christmas all year long." Uh, the civility, people like to do good and feel good about doing it, and that time of the year kind of evokes that out of us. So it's a it's a wonderful, warm, huggy kind of feeling, and time of the year. And, and yet there's a, there's a great deal of misunderstanding associated with Christmas and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll say to you again, unequivocally, the Lord Jesus Christ was not born at Christmas time or anywhere in or around December. And yet there is something very significant happening in God's purpose and program around December 25th. And I want you to listen carefully because you're going to hear people tell you time and again, 
that you can't know when Christ was born. Someone will say, well, it, you couldn't be December because it would be winter and the shepherds wouldn't be out in the fields. Somebody say, well, you know, it was after the tax time and that's the wrong season for the tax time and all of that. And I don't know about all that. But I know in the Word of God itself, apart from all that ancillary type of argument, in Scripture itself there is a definite time schedule that is given that identifies the timing of the, of the conception and birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4, the Apostle Paul says, but, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Notice, when the fullness of the time was come. Then when Jesus Christ was, was born, there was a time schedule that God Himself worked on. His, the, the timing of His birth was not simply uh, just, well, okay, I think today maybe we'll send Him down. It wasn't that at all. And you understand that Jesus Christ is the eternal uh, uh, person of the God, the manifest person of the Godhead. He's the second person of the Godhead. He's eternal God, always was God, and always will be God. He was not. He did not come into existence at his conception or at his birth. He always existed. He's the only human that that ever has lived who has who existed prior to his conception in the womb of Mary. You didn't exist before you were conceived in your mother's womb. I didn't exist before I was. We were not, you know, up yonder in heaven waiting to come down, and no stork delivered us. That's just pagan nonsense. Uh, you did not exist, and you came into existence. You, you, you became a living soul at the moment of conception in your mother's womb. And you didn't exist prior to that. And you did begin your, your existence, which is an eternal existence, eternal in the sense of the future, uh, at that moment, an everlasting existence. Now, Jesus Christ is different. If you go with me to Luke chapter number 1, I want you to study through a passage here with me that goes through the timing of the, of the, uh, the nativity. And you'll see in Luke chapter 1 a very definite dating system that identifies date-wise when the conception and birth of the Lord Jesus Christ took place. Uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke says, For as much as many as have, have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good unto me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, uh, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know how... Uh, might as know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. What Luke says there as he begins his book, he says, Look, Theophilus, I've, I've been a good historian. I've gone and checked the original references. Everything I'm going to tell you here, I've been a historian. I've gone and I've talked to the people firsthand, eyewitness accounts. Luke was a medical doctor. There are things that, that, that you read in the book of Luke you don't read anywhere, and you, anywhere else. And you get, that, you get that sense. There's a verse over there in Luke 2. It says, Mary... Uh, hid these, kept these things and pondered them in her heart. She thought about it in her heart. She never told anybody until she told Luke. Now, you know, there, there are things that a woman tells nobody but her doctor. Dr. Luke had, in, he got this personal uh, uh, human side of, uh, of the ministry and of Christ. And the book of Luke presents a touch of the Lord, a painting of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that, that paints in detail the, the humanity involved in it. Thus, it's natural, being a historian, that he would be interested in dating. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 1. Uh, we'll begin in verse 5. Therefore, there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth are the parents of John the Baptist. Verse, five, verse 7, they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest office uh, before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense, He's burning incense, and he goes in, and he sees an angel, and the angel tells him that his wife, he's going to go home, and his wife is going to conceive John the Baptist. Now, he goes home. 
And, and you remember Zechariah didn't believe it. And so the angel said, well, you're not going to be able to talk till John's born. Now, verse 23, <coughs> excuse me, it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now, I want you to follow real carefully. I'm just going to go slow here so we, we, get, we get what's going on. John's conception is, what's, is what the story is about here. Zechariah is, is in the temple, and it says that he's in the temple in, uh, in the course of Abiah. So there is a point at which Zacharias goes to Jerusalem, okay, and he ministers in Jerusalem. Then he, he learns that he's going to be the father, of uh, he's going to have a son, and his son's going to be John the Baptist. He then goes home, and uh, when he goes home, Elizabeth, his wife, conceives. Now, it probably took a day or two. Uh, if, if you go down through the passage, you'll, you'll find that he lived, uh, he, he lived in, in, a, in, a, in a city that was uh, maybe two days away from, uh, from, from where, uh, from, from Jerusalem. Um, verse 39, and, and Mary rose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of, of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah. It's about, it, it's, it's thought to have been about two days. I don't know how long, how far it was and how long it took, but uh, may, let's say it took two days for him to get there and to convince Elizabeth, he can't talk now, and you've got to get the picture of what's going on here. He, he goes home, and, and they're both old folks, you know, up in years, and, and they're past childbearing age, and their reproductive uh, uh, abilities are, are, uh, are, are uh, past now. And the verse said that, uh, that, that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. He goes home, and he can't talk. He's dumb. And he's got to convince Elizabeth that, that they're going to have a kid. She's never been able to have a kid. Now they're, they're at the place where they're not physically, you know, too, too uh, uh, virile anymore. He's got to convince her to, uh, to, to that, that they've got to try to father this, you know, parent this child. So he had, you know, he didn't just walk in and say, hey, babe, I'm home. And she was looking for him and they just hop into bed together. It didn't happen quite that way. So you give him a couple of days. So you, you figure, okay, he goes from here and then he's, then, 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 then say, uh, say two or three days and then John the Baptist is conceived. So you have John the Baptist conception at that point. Okay. Now, the reason that's important is chapter 1, verse 30, verse 26. And in the sixth month, now that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, okay? Elizabeth conceives John the Baptist, and six months later, something happens. Luke 1, 26, in the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent by God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art, art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among, woman, among women. And uh, the, you, you go on down through the passage, and the angel explains to Mary that she has found favor with God, verse 30, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Get, get the, the dating here. John goes home. Elizabeth conceives, uh, uh, Zacharias goes home. Elizabeth conceives John the Baptist. Six months after John is conceived, Mary conceives Jesus Christ, all right? The Lord Jesus Christ is, his uh, conception takes place. He's six, John is six months older than Christ. Well, now when I see that, I say to myself, if I could figure out when Zechariah was in that temple, then I could figure out when John was conceived, 
And if I can figure out when John was conceived, I can figure out when Jesus Christ was conceived. See that? By the way, the real miracle of Christmas was not, did not take place at the nativity. Nine months later, 280 days is the period of a perfect gestation period. Nine months later would be the birth of Jesus Christ. I can date the birth if I can date the conception because I know it'll be 280 days. That's a perfect gestation period for a human nine months after this point here. So I can date his birth. But the real miracle isn't at the birth. The nativity, folks, was perfectly normal and natural, a natural childbirth. The real miracle took place at his conception. You notice that it says in verse 27, the angel appeared to a virgin and said to the virgin, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That's a miracle. Now, it was, it was, it was miraculous and marvelous that Zechariah and Elizabeth were able to have John, just like it was, it was, it was, it was a marvelous when Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. They'd gone way beyond their physical ability and God restored their, their, their creative powers, their procreation powers, their sexual capacity. He did the same with this couple. But when Jesus is conceived, there was no human father involved at all. Rather, verse number 35 says, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. You see, God himself protected the issue here. Now, let's try and figure out when he was there. And, and the reason I say that, if you go back in verse number Five here, it tells you. John, uh, Luke 1, 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah. Now notice that. Verse 8. It came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God in the order of his course. Zechariah is of the course of Abiah. Now, that means he's up here in the temple ministering at a specific time. If you go to First, Chron first Chronicles chapter 24, the first 10 verses, First Chronicles 24, verse 1 to 10, you'll see how that David set out the courses for the priesthood. They begin at the Passover. And then there is a series of, of, of one-week periods of service. And in First Chronicles chapter 24, verse number 10 you'll learn that the course of Abiah is the eighth course. That is, eight weeks after the Passover. And the Passover is the beginning of uh, the religious calendar for the nation Israel. All of their divine service, all of their religious activity began on the, day, uh, on the Passover. The Passover is April 14. Then the week of the 15th through the 21st, April the 15th through the 21st, that's the Passover week. So beginning on April the 22nd, for that week, the first course of priests would come from all over Israel. They would come and that family would come and minister for one week. Then they would go home and the second course would come. And they would go home and the third course would come. And, and what would happen is that you would, you would go for eight weeks. So eight weeks over here from, from that date is going to put you where that course is. And so you're going to come in, into a, a situation where you're going to be eight weeks. You have April, May, June. You come over here, it, it'll wind up being June 17. I'm looking at the calendar here to make sure I get it straight, through the 23rd. This course, eight weeks after the Passover week here, beginning with the week of April 22nd, is going to wind up being eight weeks later will be the week of June 17 through 23. Zechariah is in the temple on the 17th through the 23rd. 
He goes home on, on June the 23rd. It takes him a couple of days. That, could, that would bring you to about June the 25th. If the conception of John the Baptist took place on June the 25th, give or take a day or two, but let's play around with that date. Uh, Zechariah, is, his dad is in the temple June 17 to 23. That's eight weeks after the Passover there. He goes home, takes him a day or two, convinces Elizabeth of what has to go on. They conceive John the Baptist, June the 25th. What, six months later, Mary is going to conceive Jesus Christ. July, September, October, November, what? What's six months after that, after June 25th? Folks, you come over here to what? December 25th. You know what December 25th represents? It has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. It represents the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nine months after that, you would have the birth of Christ, and that date would turn out to be September 29. If you add 280 days to December 25th, you come out to that, and that will put you in the time frame of, uh, of, of the, the second set of feasts in Israel with the Feast of Tabernacles and so forth. And this is when uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us and, and, and was, was manifested as such. The conception of Christ would be what was going on in December 25th. Now, that helps you understand something. It helps you understand why there's all of the, the pagan uh, confusion thrown up around December 25th. When Satan wants to counterfeit something, folks, he goes for the real thing. He goes for the thing where the real issue is. Come with me to Zechariah chapter number 12, if you will. And the real issue in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't simply the nativity. The nativity is absolutely, perfectly normal. The real issue is the conception. Because it's at the conception of Christ that God became flesh. It is at this point when God enfleshed Himself in human flesh and took upon Him a human nature because human life begins not at the nativity. And I tell you, with all of the abortion controversy and all of the other controversy today about when life begins, if there's anyone that needs to understand clearly that the nativity, the birth scene, is not where life begins, it's our generation. Life begins at conception. And the real miracle took place at conception. And if the Scripture in Luke 1 mean what they say and say what they mean, and there's no doubt in my mind that it does, the conception of Christ took place on or around December the 25th, if you follow just the simple record that Luke gave. Now, that helps you to understand, you know, there's a lot of folks that are afraid of Christmas time because of the paganness. You know, Jeremiah 10, you can see the Christmas tree. Uh, it's, it's a pagan uh, thing that, that the heathen did. In Jeremiah's day, they were doing that. In Jeremiah's day, they were worshiping the Queen of Heaven. Honoring her, you know, has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with, with, with Mary. It has nothing to do with, it's, just, it's, it's part of paganism that's been brought in. But people get all afraid of that. Let me give you something to really appreciate. Don't worry about the Christmas tree and, and all the other garbage. Appreciate what really took place then. When God himself, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. And you know who it was that came? Zechariah chapter 12, listen to this. Jehovah is speaking to the nation Israel. And he says in Zechariah 12, 10, I will pour, I, Jehovah, will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. You know who it was that died at Calvary? Jesus Christ was born so that he might go to the cross. But when he went to Calvary, folks, he didn't go simply as you and I would go as another man. Jehovah himself hung on the cross of Calvary. And that Bible says that they shall look upon, Jehovah says to Israel, they shall look upon me, Jehovah, whom they pierced. That's why in Zechariah chapter 13, he says, Awake my sword against Jehovah, says, 
Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man who is my fellow. God the Son and God the Father are one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. He was with Him, separate from Him and distinct, but He was equal with Him as God. You know what happened? The marvelous mystery is that God Himself stepped out of heaven's glory and came down to earth's midnight and enfleshed Himself in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not because He had to, but because He loved you. He valued you. And He entered into the events of human history. You say, why doesn't God do something? Oh, He already has. Why, is it, why doesn't He demonstrate His love and stop? He already has. God is a God of history, and He's entered into the events of human history by becoming one of us. That He might go to Calvary's cross and die to pay for everything that's wrong with us, with you and with me, and then have be raised from the dead so He could be the author of eternal life. You see, the wages of sin is death, and the curse of sin on man is that we die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only answer for our death and for our sin is His life. And that life is ours when we by faith rest in Him. Understand something. The real miracle was at the conception so that He, rather than having a sinful father and thus having to die for His own sins, He had no sin. God made Him to be sin for us, the one who had no sin, was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's the real miracle of what took place at Christmas time, was His coming in as our, to be our sinless Savior. Rejoice in that and get the real meaning of the season. Thanks for listening. Until next time, Maranatha. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape that we'd like you to have to go along today's study. The tape is entitled, The Real Miracle of Christmas. It sure is free of charge. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy, along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal, if you simply write us here at The Message of Grace. The address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during regular business hours at area code 708-529-0520. Request tape offer number 308. That's tape offer number 308. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us here today. If our study together has been a help to you, we would be happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rather divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know. I'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is the Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we next time for another Message of Grace. <laughs>